All right. Are we are we close here? We have our. Are you ready? Okay. Oh, their online man is ready. We will open up our meeting. So, approval of the agenda, I would like to move number nine under number seven. If that's all right with our forest guys here, Mark was just here, that we'll move it up one so you don't have to sit to the... Sound good? Anybody else have any changes just that uh, number nine would move up after number seven? All right. I will uh, entertain a motion then to approve the agenda. Okay. Doug, is there a second? All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Approval of the minutes of the 27th. Brad, is there a second? I do second. And done. Okay. Any? Not hearing anything. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. <clears throat> Do we have, we don't have any public comment uh, right now. Okay, so number four uh, is good. Number five, does anybody have a conflict of interest on anything on here? That's no. Not? Okay. Number six. Do we have any, we do have a couple of supervisors here. Uh, yes, Fran, you have to come up. Uh, yeah, there's a speaker at the podium. Uh, okay. Probably the trail, because I'm going to ask her ideas on that. Can we take those on the table? Comment, yes. Right. All right. Let's start with the trail, then. Okay. Um, as you know, I represent uh, the city of Amory. It's my supervisory district. I want to thank all of you for all the hard you work. You have a microphone. People who are listening in are not able to hear you. Okay. Hold it really close. I've been getting a lot of feedback from people trying to make sure that nobody can hear us. Like we park on Mark Baldwin. Okay. And I don't know what the trick is. Maybe you hear a sound check. Are you okay? Yeah. The microphones are a little antiquated, and so I know we're working to upgrade them. So that's the yeah, issue. Right. You kind of have to hold it near your, with your face. Okay. So, sorry about that. Um, I'll proceed then with uh, comments that I have regarding the Stour Trail. Um, I want to thank all of you for all of the hard work that you have done for the past so many months on examining this issue. I know that it's an issue where uh, not everybody is going to be happy uh, probably coming out of this, but I know that you've put a lot of hard work into it, and I, I respect that, and I, I admire your commitment to that process. Um, my comments this morning um, were to be to leave uh, the Stour Trail as it currently is now without any changes. Um, I, I think that the introduction of snowmobiles um, introduces several factors uh, that pertain to safety. Um, I think it would be speed, uh, the speed at which snowmobiles can travel, even though there may be a speed limit posted on the trail, um, I think that it would be difficult to monitor and enforce. 
and then also the possibility of um, alcohol as well. Uh, many times, uh, people who are are out on the trails are kind of bar hopping. Now, I've done a little bar hopping myself back in the day. I don't have anything against people doing a little bar hopping and having a few beers. But certainly, you're introducing alcohol and speed into a situation that doesn't currently have it. There are snowmobile trails in the county right now that go from Amory to Osceola. So there is an existing route for people who want to go that way. Um, it, it's not like they don't have anything else available for them to go. You know, also as far as an economic impact goes, there are really, uh, with the exception of the Brothers Country Mart, there's not really any businesses right on the Seller Trail that would directly benefit from from having increased traffic there. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, I, I respect the work you've put in. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, the state owns the trail and not the county. I think the county's expended uh, resources already uh, financially in the study of these issues. And um, I think it's time to consider how much money are we going to spend on something that we don't really own. Although I understand the county's uh, custodial input uh, in the process, and I respect that, um, I would like all of you to uh, keep an open mind this morning uh, when you're listening to the public comments. Um, you know, I don't know if people's minds are already made up or not, but I, I would respect uh, ask that you um, respect the process and keep an open mind when you're listening to all the public uh, comments this morning. Uh, and with that, that's um, all I would like to say about that. Okay, thank you. Nope, I was hoping that was it. No problem. Did you want to talk about the trail, Amy? You want to talk about the trail and go back home? Yes, let's do okay. one or the other. Okay. We're not bouncing back. Do you have okay. something on the trail, too? Um, thank you. Let's get this down. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. I've been here before many times. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all the work on this. Um, just a, a little bit of history. Can you tell if I'm doing a good sound check on this? Is it okay? <laughs> um, as you know, the town of Osceola has a comp plan. When we did our comp plan eight-ish years ago, we did a survey. In that survey, we had unanimous uh, – or not unanimous, majority of people said, we need more non-motorized trails. We love our sour. Then we came and had a county process, and – I can hold my mic and show you this. I'll just show you this. So you'll see a, a stack of blue, a stack of yellow, and the blue was the comments that in this first process that we went through, phase one, This the blue were the non-motorized, keep it the way it is, please, comments, and the other ones were add ATVs or snowmobiles or both. So I just want you to remember there's a long, long storied history of public input in this process. And I know they're, they're all a little bit weary, wary of the public input piece, um, and want to make sure they're still heard, so I just wanted to remind you that. Um, the other piece is, we're, we're starting this trail advisory group. So, the trail advisory group is tasked with looking at the county, finding gaps, looking at where we can put ATV trails, where we can connect snowmobile trails, what bike pieces need to be connected, and I really don't want to start that process by displacing a bunch of users that are using uh, the Sour Trail. So I am in the keep it the same way, let's leave it the way it is. We don't want to displace the current users. We have a ton of users, and um, I don't think we should start a county-wide visioning process about trails <laughs> with a position on the Sour where we kick a bunch of users off. So that's that's my um, sort of big picture policy thing that I think we should be really careful about what we do today and, and keep the status quo and, and let this process countywide work its way through um, the process. So that's my trail stuff. Does it help now? Any? Just to warn you, are you here on the trail? Too? Oh, okay. Let's kind of keep it all in one group. I share the sentiments about the trail because my grandchildren use it. I have uh, a daughter who lives uh, over by Wanderers, and they get on there and use the bike trail. I have family in Amory, 
They start about this tall and they start cross country skiing about that tall. And, uh, they've been using that trail and helping develop it for, for years. So I'm in support of, uh, leaving the trail as is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now you have your cable staff. All right. Okay. okay, yesterday Health and Human Services Committee met, and one of the things they examined were potential impacts of CAFOs on, on public health within Polk County. Um, there were a number of issues that came up at that time uh, that um, they would like the opportunity to gather more information on and to be able to make a, spe a more specific recommendation to the Environmental C Services Committee about that. Uh, part of the issues that they uh, would like to examine, um, you know, certainly is that uh, the companies that want to come into Polk County with CAFOs are oftentimes foreign multinational companies. Uh, they're looking for places like uh, Polk County that have little to no regulation in place. That's where they want to come in. Uh, because they have more freedom than to uh, do things the way that they would like to do them. Uh, and my view is that we need to protect the county both financially uh, to whatever degree legally possibly we can and the health and safety of residents of the county. Um, I have a copy of the proposed uh, resolution that would uh, um, regulate by conditional use permit. Um, I don't see where this has what the application fee is for the conditional use permit. Um, I don't know if there is an application fee or not. Maybe there is. Um, I would propose that the application fee be $10,000 whether it is issued or not. Uh, that is chump change to these big corporations. It's nothing. Um, if they want to come here and do business here, we welcome them with open arms. But we want them to abide by our regulations and respect our population and respect us as a county. <clears throat> Something that um, I proposed um, and that was discussed <clears throat> excuse me discussed yesterday at Health and Human Services is um, I, I recognize there's some language in there about things that they have to pay for as part of the application process. I proposed um, adding a section R to that. Um, I have copies of this ordinance. If you would like it, I can pass it out. Or, excuse me, not ordinance, uh, addition to the resolution. Um, what I'm proposing is that upon application for a conditional use permit, the applicant shall agree to fully compensate the county for all legal services, expert consulting services, and other expenses which may be reasonably incurred by the county in reviewing and considering the application, regardless of whether or not the application for a permit is subsequently approved or denied by the county board. The applicant shall submit an administrative fee escrow as required by Polk County. Um, I don't think we ought to gouge anybody here, but this is uh, potentially a very expensive proposition for the county, not just in the application phase, but after uh, CAFOs are, are permitted and there are conditional uses um, granted here, the county is going to incur a lot of expense investigating the inevitable complaints. And I understand that we are bound by law to do that through public health to investigate those complaints. Um, at what is going to end up being the county expense. Um, <clears throat> so this is a measure um, to investigate how we can uh, legally recover our fees and our expenses so this doesn't become a burden to the county financially that we're investigating multiple complaints at the county's expense. It may be through the uh, application, permit application process, may be the only opportunity we have to recover um, some some of those uh, expenses moving forward. Um, also, I do, uh, do want to thank all of you for the work that you've put in here. 
I understand you probably have some caseful fatigue about now, uh, kind of like the stellar trail fatigue. It's been an ongoing issue for a while. Um, I'm not uh, suggesting in any way that uh, we should go back to square one and start all over again or anything like that at all. I grew up on a family farm. I have a lot of love and respect for the farmers of this county. Um, I have family members who are farming in this county right now. Um, I don't want also any of the CAFO regulations to impact our local small family farmers. Um, but I also think it's important um, that we protect their interests as well. Um, also, we have a number of small meat processors here in Polk County. Um, I don't know if we've heard from any of them or not, how uh, they may feel about the possibility of Something like this coming in, I understand caseloads have a right to exist. I'm certainly not going to debate that at all. Um, but uh, from a, a public health uh, point of view, there are several points that I'd like to make that I don't feel are adequately maybe addressed. Um, and I don't know maybe the best way to incorporate those things into, uh, say, uh, the application process. Um, you know, I understand this is being addressed through zoning, uh, more or less, and conditional use permits. I don't know if it is too late in the process to consider or if there would even be any interest in maybe taking the elements of the conditional use and incorporating them into an ordinance. I feel an ordinance would have more teeth in it and also uh, would be maybe easier to enforce than a uh, conditional use permit process uh, would be. Although there, you know, I recognize there are benefits to having conditional use as well. Um, but as far as public health and uh, safety goes, um, if we had a mechanism to recover costs associated with the permitting, like testing groundwater, surface water, air quality, pathogens, insect vectors, and other outside consulting services such as engineering and possibly legal. Now, um, you know, I, I, I think there may be several different ways that that may be possible uh, that we could look into and investigate. I know it's being done. Other places uh, are doing this, either through mechanisms such as an escrow performance bond or an insurance company. Uh, with naming uh, uh, Polk County as an additionally insured party uh, that comes from that. Um, so those are, are the thoughts that I have. Um, you know, I made copies to pass this out if any of you are interested in it. But really the main thing that came out of Health and Human Services yesterday is they want the opportunity to participate and put input into the process from a public health point of view because when complaints do come in, they are going to be the agency that is going to be uh, a key player in investigating and dealing with those complaints. Um, I also understand that there's a mechanism in place uh, for a, a daily fine process or a daily citation process on violations. Um, I believe that the cost of violations is somewhere between $100 or $200. Um, that's nothing. There's, uh, for these great big foreign multinational companies that own CAFOs, they'll happily pay a few hundred bucks a day to keep doing business as usual. That's a lot of money to me, and it may be a lot of money to people here, but to them, it's, it's nothing. Um, they expect regulation. They expect to have to comply to regulation. That's part of their business. I think they try to get into areas that have as little regulation as possible, and uh, my point of view is we don't want to see the county taken advantage of. We want to make sure that the county health uh, and financial uh, liabilities are, are addressed and covered to the legal extent possible. Thank you. Did you have any comments today? Missed anything? Okay. Thank you, Fran. Um, so... Um, I don't have a lot of details on, on stuff. I, I had some um, things I wanted to talk to you about that kind of have solidified in my brain after I was here last time with that 
very large document that I dumped on you guys. My apologies. Um, but really, the the the, the document, the, the CUP permit, I guess I'll call it, is kind of an after-the-fact thing. So we had staff come in. So Tanya was here last time. Those in, were incorporated in a fine form. You know, do this if something happens, do that if, if something happens. But it's all after the fact. The cat's out of the bag by this point. And so it really still is a behind the eight ball. We're caught flat-footed when something happens kind of permitting process. So that's that still remains one of my top concerns is that we're not protecting public health and we don't have a uh, an application that makes the company prove that they're not going to pollute the county. Um, and I want to make sure that with Fran's comments about um, input, we know staff did input, but it's the committee that hasn't had a chance to get their head around this at all. So that was pretty apparent yesterday that the committee is still kind of processing this and had a lot of questions and concerns. Um, Fran touched on the application fee. We still don't have a performance bond application fee, kind of enough money there, there that piece. But the 200 feet, um, we've got it up to 200 feet. But that's an unlimited amount of storage. That's an unlimited amount of manure, unlimited amount of hogs, maybe composting um, bodies or placentas, whatever that is. It's still only 200 feet um, away. Um, I would like some more details on the mortality plan, exactly what are the performance check, check marks that we're going to hit with this. Um, the other piece is what happens to the unzoned towns? It's not really clear to me that when this goes through, if the unzoned towns are even protected. So. That was one of my questions, um, and, you know, if the operations ordinance were something that we're kicking around were to happen, that would protect everyone and not just those of us that are zoned in zone towns. Um, some of us supervisors have been kicking around this idea of a, an ordinance that would put some teeth, kind of what Fran was talking about, and maybe be more of an operations space, really kind of more focused on the public health side of things, that it's protective, you have to prove this is wrong. We can have higher surety, surety or, uh, bonds, et cetera, et cetera, and that might uh, be where this process moves. Um, lastly, I I know you guys have been in here gutting it out in the trenches of CAFO and Stower, but all of a sudden this winter CAFO hit, I mean COVID hit, and things are moving really fast. We haven't been able to have we, – we've had awkward and um, – Difficult public comment, you know, it's hard for people to hear, their phones might not work, the, their Wi-Fi's aren't, you know, people don't have a lot of e emails. So there's been this awkward public input piece. And yesterday it became clear to me at Health and Human Services that there's a lot of questions about the health side of this that that committee needs answers. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people on this cable. We had 200 people come to Unity. Um, we've had 100 people packed in this room at times. This is this and Stower are the two hottest issues this county has seen in maybe, I don't know, 10 years. Um, and I just wanted to paint a little picture about what's going to happen next week at our board meeting. So next week at our board meeting day, and Vince, put your head, figure out our logistics on this. So we have our strategic planning meeting all afternoon. So we spend the afternoon doing our goal setting strategic planning. Then we leave that meeting and we walk out and we do a memorial for Jim which I think needs the space and time and energy to give his family the room to kind of not be rushed. Um, then we come in and have a board meeting that's absolutely packed with the two hottest issues that we've had in 10 years. And I don't think it really gives Jim the space that we want to give for his funeral memorial piece. Um, and it's following on the heels of, I think, this pent-up public comment piece that I know people were able to comment on Stour, but it's sort of awkward. You have to come in and blah, 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 and people try to call in, but it doesn't really work, and now all of our agendas say no public comment. And, and it's just been – I think there's a number of factors that we should really think about um, with our meeting next week and move something out of the way. Something something should give, and, and you guys in this committee can maybe adjust that. And, and I think the CAFO piece would be the one that I would say should – Let's move forward on Stour, but let's hold off on CAFO so that we don't pack everybody into the same thing. We're just trying to do too much in one day. So that's just my administrative piece. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Mr. Warno, anything on CAFO? Cool. Yep. 
question for Corporation Council. Yep. So, <coughs> Supervisor Middleton and Duncan indicated that the Health and Human Services yesterday they spoke about payrolls, but I don't recall anything on their agenda being agenda for discussion on payrolls. Mr. Loso attended the Health and Human Services Board meeting yesterday and did provide that uh, board with advice regarding the open meetings law, so I'll have to follow up with him. Um, but I am, my understanding was from Mr. Loso that the board itself decided to ask uh, Supervisor Duncanson to put her concept into a motion or resolution and bring it forward to their next board meeting. Um, but I, again, I was not in attendance. If I may, th there was a line item on capos for discussion. So that there was discussion on uh, capo. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to address the concept of a performance bond before since it, it was brought up, if that's okay, unless you want me to wait until... Let's wait until the cable's stop. Okay. Let's go in order so we're not bouncing back and forth okay. so much. All right? All right. Number seven. Tax delinquent properties. Some good news. Sure Could you use the microphone? People are not able to hear you. Lot one, the price for the committee on lot one for the 9.4 acres was 75000 High bid on that one was $65,000. The next lot that is 1.69 acres, the committee wanted $500 for that one. The high bid on that was $2,850. And on lot two, the 10.51 acres, the committee wanted $30,000 as a price. That one high bid right now is $46,500. So overall, we came in very well on the properties combined. So we'd be looking for a motion to either proceed with the sale or not to. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? That the sale did go good. Uh, yeah, so I'll entertain a motion either to sell or not sell. To approve. Okay. Is there a second? Does anybody have any questions about the property or anything? If not, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay, the next option then just for come up in another month or two yet for the uh, new stuff when it says coming? That will come later this fall. Okay. Due to the COVID, that's delayed a little bit sure. with the uh, taxis coming in there. So that will be later on this fall. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we move forestry up. So, Mark, you're here. Yep. Yeah. Can you wait for your 
So we need that. So the next meeting will go through these. Or now. Okay. What I just handed out concerning the forestry 15-year comprehensive forest plan is uh, two chapters that would be considered a addendum. Uh, the reason I'm bringing them up today, I just didn't want you guys surprised because I am going to be posting all the chapters associated with the 15-year plan uh, sometime this week, getting them on the forestry page and making these chapters available to the public. Um, the first piece of paper that I handed out to you is chapter 2000 and what that chapter serves to do is kind of two things. Um, it, it serves as a placeholder for all the annual work plans and also the accomplishment reports. Uh, there is a summary of kind of the needs of of the forest. It, it, it's pretty simple I guess at this point it would involve replacing the vehicles, reforestation activities, and things of that sort. And also, it kind of has a outline associated with all the accomplishments within the forest, concentrating mainly on reforestation, other civic cultural activities, and the harvest over the last, um, what would that be, 25 years or 24 years since 1996. Um, I, I guess there isn't a whole lot of room for input on these chapters. It serves as an appendix, kind of a history of the things that have occurred on the forest. Um, any questions on Chapter 2000? I, I realize I just handed it out, but again, I didn't want you guys to be surprised seeing that posted out on the website, and um, there it is in front of you today. The second piece of paper I handed out is Chapter 4000. I guess there's no Chapter 3000. Polk County Forest doesn't need to utilize that because we have two distinctive blocks that are distinctive geographically, one in the northwest, one in the northeast. Um, bigger forests are going to be utilizing those chapters, but just the geographic nature of, of the Polk County Forest, um, we don't need to fill any anything out associated with that chapter. The last piece of paper is uh, Chapter 4000, and all I'm doing is reiterating what we talked about at the last meeting, which essentially we're moving everything up. Initially, I had this plan going to the county board in September. Um, that has been moved up to August to allow time to the have the county board review the whole 15-year plan. It, it buys the county board a little more time, so um, you'll find that in Chapter 4000. So. So just on 2000, will that be updated? This gets updated almost yearly then to keep up to date? If this would be updated yearly almost, all your work plans and everything. Correct. So 2000, this would be the first time that you guys have seen it. Think of it as an appendix and a placeholder for all the work plans and accomplishment reports that began in 2021 through 2035 will be in this. This is the place where where they will be parked. Okay, so they'll be in there every year, pretty much. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else with a question? Do we need uh, a motion to move this to approve it? No, this is just not yet. Forward. After so basically um, outlined in kind of Chapter 4000, 
This does need to go through a public comment process, which I'll be taking comments by way of email. Um, as of right now, I'm still planning on having a open house type of public comment where I'll have four different stations and I'll take comments at that time also on the evening of July 14th from 5 to 7. Um, we'll play this COVID stuff by ear. And I guess if we have a second wave or what have you, we'll rethink that. And I did ask the DNR this question, and if we do have to cancel um, the open house, that would be fine, just because we are doing the 30 days associated with um, comments by way of posting it on the forestry page, and I'll be taking an ad out in the paper and taking comments um by way of email. What I do have to do, the bare minimum, is a 30-day comment period. Okay. All right, and I'll keep us on track, too, then, won't All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right. So, number eight's going to be about how long? Should we take a short break before we go into that? The actual video itself is 50 minutes. 50? 50, yes. And then Ben has uh, compiled in all the written comments as well. And you're going to hand that out. Is that correct, Ben? Everybody, everybody already has all the Okay. Approval lab. So, Chairman O'Connell, if you'd like to have a recess. I, let's have a short break so that we, we don't have to break during the, uh, during the video. Is that me? <laughs> okay, we're good now. Um, so we have we have uh, roughly 50 minutes of video. We had 33 participants come in over two days and record video testimony for us on Tuesday and Wednesday last week, as well as um, I handed out a, a packet of written comments that were submitted in this last round via email. Um, so there's two in, in the packet. Your first stapled page is the list of people that came in to do the video. The second stapled bunch in there are the folks, the comments for no change of use on the sour, and then the third stapled packet are all the comments that had to do with yes to a change of use, be it snowmobiles or equestrians. So uh, I think with that, the video is probably, probably ready to go, um, unless there's any questions before the video gets going. Just to help everybody out now, we'll get this, and then this goes to the July County Board is what we're going to look at, but it'll be in our next meeting. This will go to... User updates. Right, it'll, it'll be in the July County Board. We have to do a public notice, though. Um, so I, I think we need a recommendation today in order to make that Class 2 notice. Okay. So... Yep. Um, Chairman O'Connell, yes, um, Tool Design, our consultants, are scheduled to uh, deliver a presentation similar to the one back in February to this committee at the July regular county board meeting. And so if you were to postpone uh, the recommendation of the county board, we'd reschedule that to a later month. But that's that's the process. Um, as as we speak right okay, now. Okay, that's the process of the schedule. All right. <clears throat> All right, everybody ready? All right, let's start our video. Good morning. Uh, my name is Danny Carlson. I'm from Frederick. Uh, I'm with the Polk County Snowmobile Council. Um, we are uh, for putting motorized snowmobiles on the winter use trails 
Uh, reason is, is we are running into a lot of opposition on trail closures. Uh, last year we lost about 15 miles of trail on private property. I had a call on Sunday on 120 acres up by west of Frederick that are closing us down there. We're going to probably have to close that trail. These railroad grades were all set up at the beginning for motorized and non-motorized multi-use trails, and I think that's the way it should be. Thank you. Yep. All right. Paul Isaacson, Mayor of Amory, Wisconsin, and I live in Amory, Wisconsin. Uh, I was reading through the Polk County website, uh, page Forestry Parks and Trails, and uh, their mission is to develop, maintain, and preserve our park, lake access, and trail systems. When it says our park, lake access, and trail systems, that means Polk County parks, trails, and, and trail systems. They'll meet the needs of the citizens and future generations, preserve and protect the county's open space, water, historical, natural, economic resources, and provide recreation and tourism opportunities. As we go on, uh, why are we spending, uh, I'd say about $50,000 in uh, time and on studies on land that we, Polk County, don't own? Stour and Cattail Trail state lands. Stour and Cattail Trail are state lands and this money should be spent on county parks and trail improvements. We paid tool design for the recommend, recommended plan, which includes horses and pedestrians on separate treads for safety. Footprints are the worst on wet limestone and will take trail, make the trail unusable for uh, pedestrians and bikers. Is Polk County prepared for the extra maintenance if uh, horses are on the trail? Do you expect the Friends of the Stour to keep up with their maintenance program to the level that they are now? Um, the City of Amory will be incorporating a uh, half mile on each trail for bicycle and pedestrian uses, including safe routes to school program on the Cattail Trail. Safety measures will have to be incorporated such as speed limits uh, uh, and signage to the effect of children on the uh, trail for a half mile. Is the state going to allow pedestrians on the Star Trail when open for snowmobiles? Please consider the safety of all as you move forward. Paul Isaacson, Mayor Amory. Hello, my name is Jane Mushkin. I'm here representing Backcountry Horsemen of Wisconsin and I'm offering comments on the Stour Seven Lakes Trail Master Plan. Backcountry Horsemen of Wisconsin is a service organization dedicated to working on trails, enjoying trails, and educating and advocating for public access for equestrians. We appreciate the opportunity to prevent comments. Backcountry Horsemen of Wisconsin is recommending that trail use be expanded to include equestrian users. One of the objectives identified in the draft plan is to provide opportunities for the greatest number of projected users. To meet this objective, multiple user groups are being and must continue to be allowed on the trail and equestrian users should be allowed on the trail and added as a user group. We recognize the benefits of multiple use trails. By expanding user types, we're creating opportunities for expansion of local partnerships, we're creating opportunities for unified voice to work together on shared issues, and you tap into another collection of workers to help maintain and repair trail segments. It's not our intent to have equestrian use on the trail added at the expense of already existing trail users. We just want to have equine users added to the list of multiple users. Allowing equestrian use on the trails <coughs> not always will also allow riders another place to ride and it adds another opportunity for expanded partnerships for use and maintenance of the trail. Backcountry Horsemen in Wisconsin partners with local groups and volunteers to work side by side with local folks in trail maintenance and improvement projects. In 2019, our volunteer hours were valued at over $21,700. For a volunteer-based organization, we put a lot of time and effort into equine trails. We also have access to grant funding that will help with trail projects, including funding from Wisconsin State Horse Council and Backcountry Horsemen of America. There are many equine multiple-use trails in the state of Wisconsin with a variety of user combinations. You know the list, bicycles, bear hunters, walking trails, UTVs, ATVs, and snowmobiles. 
posting signage, identifying who's got the right of way among various users and other methods of education for all user groups can help minimize trail conflicts. There's a number of requests for design and maintenance reference materials we also have at our fingertips that are available if necessary. And I have read user comments regarding the beauty of the trees along the trail and the overhanging branches and, equest and concern that equestrian users would uh, cause that to be lost. And I hope you understand equestrian users are just as moved and interested in protecting aesthetics of trails we ride on. We do need a bit more head clearance, but we can accomplish that and still protect trail aesthetics. Also acknowledge that Governor Knoll State Forest has an extensive network of trails. However, not everyone has a whole day to commit to going up there and riding. Many opportunities for public land, many riding opportunities, in, there's very limited riding opportunities in public land in the county. And many riders are interested in short outings just for an evening, allowing equestrian use on the Star Trail would provide that kind of opportunity, just as it does for other users to enjoy a short outing. Figures compiled by Wisconsin State Horse Council in 2017 show the impact of recreational trail use in Wisconsin is valued at $298 million. 55% of Wisconsin horse, horse owners use horses for pleasure trail riding, and thanks for the opportunity to comment. Two sentences short. <laughs> oh. Hi, my name is Jim Judkins, and I live in the town of Osceola. As a homeowner and taxpayer for over 25 years whose property abuts the Stour Trail, my strong desire is to keep the trail as non-motorized. I strongly oppose uh, allowing ATVs, UTVs, snowmobiles, other motorized vehicles on the trail. I'm also against allowing horses on the trail. Some important points. The, the Stour Trail is the only non-motorized trail completely within the county and is an outstanding gem. The popularity of this non-motorized trail is continuing to grow with a steady stream of hikers, bicyclists, including many families and children. The inclusive argument by the motorized proponents is an empty argument. That is, we want to, the trail to be open to everyone. While ATV and snowmobile riders would not be intimidated by hikers or bicy bicyclists, no hiker or bicyclist that I know would be comfortable sharing the trail with motorized vehicles. It is more than uncomfortable, it is unsafe, especially for children. This isn't a matter of, ex of excluding anyone, but rather a matter of safety. For example, interstate highways do not allow pedestrians or bicyclists, not because the Department of Transportation wants to exclude people, but simply because it would be unsafe to allow pedestrians and bicyclists into the interstate highway environment. There's no practical way to widen the trail corridor in order to accommodate separate motorized and non-motorized trails. It would be prohibitively expensive, cut, fills, wetlands, bridges, and extremely questionable if all environmental permits could be obtained. My property value would plummet from the noise and dust pollution from the trail. At my corner of my house is approximately 90 feet from the edge of the trail. Horses are huge, powerful, and intimidating animals. Horse poop is a smelly, messy, fly-attracting problem. Also, horses' hooves would damage the trail surface, making trip hazards and bike, biking and walking unsafe. For the long-term welfare of the good citizens of Polk County, I urge the state and county officials to do whatever they can to maintain this wonderful trail as non-motorized, and thank you for your consideration. You're on. All right. My name is Mark Farrell. I live, I live pretty close to the trail, within a thousand feet, and I'm very concerned about the possible potential future for basically the deterioration or the total destruction of the trail with the current, the current uh, potential uses of it, adding horses. Um, I just don't think it's a good idea to go ahead and commingle such disparate activities as walking, hiking, riding your bike with thousand pound beasts that are notorious for their skittishness to begin with. Um, I know because I've been kicked by a horse before and it's extremely painful. Anyway, I just, uh, I am very uncomfortable sharing the trail with a horse. And what will basically happen if you go ahead with this stupid proposal and try to commingle these activities, which just are not meant to um, commingle with each other, is basically bicyclers, hikers, joggers, walkers, everybody will just quit using the trail, not only because of the fear of the thousand pound animals, but the horses will obviously destroy the trail because of their weight and impact on the soft shoulders of the trail. Plus, who wants to ride a bike while dodging road apples all day on the trail, which is really, 
really not my idea of enjoying bike ride. There are the only people basically who are going to benefit from a proposal like this are going to be the lawyers because they're going to get involved and they're going to benefit greatly overall because this is really, really a bad idea. It's just these are activities that just simply aren't meant to coexist in the same space. I've been on the trail hundreds of times. I use it frequently, several times a week. And there's many spots of the trail, a great deal of the trail where it simply is not wide enough to justify the use of these, of these activities in such close proximity to each other. Uh, would you be comfortable bringing your young children onto a trail with a thousand pound animal that at any moment could rear or cause severe, severe damage to uh, the human body. As well, what will happen eventually if that does occur, that the bikers, hikers, children will no longer be able to use the trail uh, safely. And if they do continue to use the trail, it's just a matter of time before some serious injury will most likely occur. Like I said, the only people who are going to benefit are going to be the attorneys. And I don't, they're, they're, what we need here in Polk County are more activities, more healthy activities, not less. And by, by uh, displacing all of us people that like to ride our bike or hike the trail, we've got nowhere else to go, basically. And in, in its current composition, the trail just simply is not compatible to co-mingling these kinds of activities in the same location. Is that it? Hi everyone, I'm Wanda Brown from St. Croix Falls in the city and um, I'm here to testify to convince you to keep the Stour Trail as a non-motorized, non-horse trail and it's, uh, it's wide enough for people to hike and bike and push baby strollers and just walk and smell the flowers and listen to the birds and look at the trees and then in the winter time to cross-country ski. I love cross-country skiing and there are not many of our trails that we can do that on because they've all been motorized in the winter. So we need to at least keep this one so that we can ski on a very great spot um, and have place to go. The state park has gotten rid of most of their skiing. Um, there are some other places, but there's lots of places for people to have their ATVs. I have great friends with ATVs, but they don't need all the trails. We need to maintain some for the rest of us. The idea of sharing the trails is a great democratic idea. Let's evenly share them. You can't do that and safely be on the trails together because guys zooming and girls zooming on ATVs are ripping up the trail and they're unsafe to be by. You have a, somebody zipping at you, you got a baby in a baby carriage, you're not going to be out there. And you certainly can't cross country ski with a motor, motorized snow machine zipping at you. So please, please keep the Stour Trail completely unmotorized. Now, they've talked about having two trails side by side. Well, you'd need a concrete barrier in the middle, which would take up way too much space. And, um, and so that's really not going to work either. And there's a lot of water going along there. To make it wide enough to have two trails, that would be great. But I don't think it'll work because there's not enough room. So please, let the Stour Trail stay completely unmotorized and unhorsebacked because they're not really compatible with people on bicycles or baby strollers either. Thank you. Bye. Hi, I'm Jean Vogel. I'm from Franconia or the Schaefer, Minnesota area, and I come over to the Stour quite frequently in the winter and in the summer, and I too am very much against all motorized use of that trail. I come over for quiet and peace. I come over there with my girlfriends and their little grandkids, and there are so many other miles of trail that the motorized people can use, and there's not that much left for us hikers and snowshoers and silent sports people. So I beg of you to please 
consider not allowing any motorized vehicles on that trail. Leave us uh, one beautiful trail for all of us to enjoy um, in, the, in the summer and in the winter without any buzzing of motorized vehicles going past us or um, endangering our kids on, the, on their bikes. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. My name's Doug Johnson. I live a mile south of Amory. I'm with the Polk County Snowmobile and ATV Council. It has been suggested by some that Polk County has rushed through the master planning process for the Stour Seven Lakes Trail. Since the original master plan was approved by the Polk County Board allowing all recreational trail users to share this abandoned railroad right-of-way in 2004, a relatively small group has worked hard to limit our ability to develop this regional asset to its fullest extent. 2004 to 2020, 16 years. Since this particular stretch of railroad right-of-way was first abandoned in 1998, snowmobilers have endeavored to add it to the existing Polk County snowmobile trail system. The property was acquired by the state and in 2003, Polk County entered into a lengthy process to develop a master plan for what was then known as the Amory to Dresser Trail as required by the DNR. County is required to identify the users. The DNR approves the plans, not the uses. Polk County Board approved a plan that included motorized and non-motorized trail users in 2004. Following county approval of the 2004 plan, many hundreds of volunteer man hours were invested in the trail preparation process to bring the trail up to state standards. Immediately thereafter, a lawsuit was filed to prevent snowmobiles and ATVs from using the trail they had just prepared for everyone to use. 2016, a change to the statute describing state trails brought up the possibility of making the trail available to all users as it was, was originally intended. 2018, Polk County identified a subcommittee consisting of representatives from the stakeholder groups to assist with developing a new master plan that would be more accommodating to a larger number of potential users of this remarkable regional asset. August 2018, the subcommittee completed their work recommending to the Environmental Services Committee that snowmobiles and horses be added as new users of the trail. September 2018, the Environmental Services Committee unanimously passed a motion to move the proposed master plan to the Polk County Board. August 2019, Polk County hired Tool Design, a trail planning consultant, to assist with addressing issues in the master plan identified by the DNR. August 2019, to January 2020, Polk County and Tool Design working together produced a new master plan with a set of alternatives including snowmobile and equestrian use. January 2020, Polk County asked for public input on snowmobile and equestrian alternatives via an online survey. February 2020, Environmental Services Committee recommended sending the draft plan to the full board with snowmobiles and equestrian alternatives. March to June 2020, the final public hearing on the master plan for the Stour was scheduled. Let's get this done so we can finally move on to other business. Thank you. My name is Ann Miller and I'm a resident of the town of Osceola. I am here today to ask that the county leave the Stour Seven Lakes State Trail as it currently is, a year-round non-motorized trail. I live less than half a mile from the trail and it is my go-to location for physical activities and mental health breaks during the spring, summer, and fall. I use this trail because it is safe, quiet, and beautiful. On a hot summer day, as soon as you enter the tree tunnels of the trail, the temperature drops 10 to 15 degrees. The amount of wildlife from chipmunks to deer to bears and birds and native wildflowers that can be seen while on the trail leaves me in awe of the nature that we are so fortunate to have in Polk County. I would first like to address the county's desire to add snowmobiles to the Stour Trail. Adding snowmobiles to the trail is a safety issue to the cross-country skiers, snowshoers, and flat tire bikers that currently use the trail. This addition of snowmobiles will drive these silent sport enthusiasts away from the trail and our county. Not only will winter users be affected by the snowmobiles, but summer users will as well. The tree tunnels that I just mentioned as a benefit to summer trail users will be gone after the tree canopy is trimmed away for snowmobile usage. The entire character of the trail will be forever changed. Secondly, I would like to address the addition of horses to the trail. Again, this is a safety issue for the current silent sports users of the trail. The trail is simply not wide enough to accommodate horses and bikers and walkers. 
Often when riding my bike, I come upon walkers and startle them when I announce my presence to pass them. I am afraid of what could happen when I startle a horse. While I understand that there is a need for more horse trails in the area, I don't believe that a shared trail would be in the best interest of any of the parties involved in using the trail in the spring, summer, and fall. According to the Polk County website, there are currently more than 360 miles of snowmobile trails. These trails already bring in numerous people to our region. Adding 13 plus miles of the Stour Trail to the snowmobile trail system will not greatly increase the number of people coming to snowmobile, as I have heard argued. What will make a greater economic impact is continuing to provide diversity and activities by maintaining a silent sport trail that absolutely anyone can use simply by just getting on the trail and walking. I would propose that Polk County leave the Stour Seven Lakes State Trail as is and market the trail as a way for people to get out into nature. People will come to Polk County for this trail as a silent sport trail and will spend as much money in Polk County as anyone looking for a motorized vehicle experience. Thank you. Todd Miller, 404 Bold County Road W, Frederick, Wisconsin. Good afternoon. I'm Todd Miller, President of the Polk County Snowmobile Council. I am here representing our council and its 629 members. We do not keep track of individual members, so this number may include, does include couples and families. This number would be the minimum. Our council is in favor of the Amory to Dresser Trail being open for snowmobiles. Everyone knows the results from both surveys. It was overwhelming in favor of snowmobile use, not just from the residents of Polk County, but the state of Wisconsin and surrounding states. Number one reason to open the Stour Trail to snowmobiles is safety. I'll read that again. Number one reason to open the Stour Trail to snowmobiles is safety. The current Snowmobile trail going west of Amory is definitely not ideal for its users. Personally, I will not come into Amory from the west unless I absolutely have to. Most other riders feel the same way. So let's move this plan ahead and have a safe route west of Amory this upcoming year. Thank you. My name is Melvin Smith. I'm from, Milton, I'm from Luck, Wisconsin. I'm part of the Polk County Snowmobile Council. And I'm here to recommend option S, SA3 to allow snowmobiles on the entire trail without no changes, and EA2 without no changes. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Peter Henry, I live in the town of Blackbrook at 1029 35th Avenue. I've been involved in this in one way or another for the last 20 years. Um, now it's down to snowmobiles and horsebacks on a pedestrian and bicycle trail. And I'm opposed to this. I'm utterly opposed to this for a variety of reasons. Um, first of all, on snowmobiles, um, the trail was developed as a pedestrian trail. We all know that. I've got the engineering docks at home. It's a 10 foot wide tread. That also happens to be the minimum width that is allowed for a two way snowmobile trail. As you probably know, in the state of Wisconsin, by constitution, a pedestrian trail is a state park. It has to be open to all citizens who travel by foot. So you cannot ever close a pedestrian trail on a state park in Wisconsin. Yet you are proposing to completely use the entire tread, all 10 feet for a two-way snowmobile trail. There is no way that this will promote health or safety for the residents of Polk County or its visitors. I think we've seen with the virus outbreak and now um, the rioting that health and safety of the public is of paramount concern and importance for our public officials and to put high speed vehicles on a pedestrian trail is very poor public policy. It's extremely dangerous. It will result in injuries and it will result in great expense to the county taxpayers, of which I am one. And I do not want to pay taxes to deal with lawsuits from injuries on a pedestrian trail that is going to be inundated with snowmobiles. When it comes to horses, um, has this been tried anywhere in the state of Wisconsin? I sure would like to see a trail that has bicycles and horses. How do you handle the horse poop? 
and I've been to all the parking facilities for this trail, there simply is not a place to put horse trailers. These parking facilities are undersized to begin with. You can barely get my truck in there. So how are we going to um, have horse trailers, um, have them have water, um, and then how are we gonna maintain the trail and get the horse poop off the trail? It's a very bad idea, it also is dangerous. I don't know horses, I'm not around horses. I don't know what makes them startle, but I see people wearing helmets when they ride horses. And so um, I think it's also a very bad idea and um, I am opposed to both of these added uses. I think it will displace um, pedestrians and bicyclists. Thank you for your time. All right. Hi, I'm Heidi, and I am from actually Danbury, Wisconsin. Um, I am here in to support the Stour to continue the uses as it is now, people powered all year round. And I have a couple of questions that I want to propose. One of them is, is do we, is the county board and representatives morally think it's okay to take away a trail and user groups? Horses and bikers are conflicting uses. Snowmobiles and cross country skiing and snowshoeing are conflicting users. So if it's okay, if we're assuming it's okay to, to put conflicting users on the same trail, how is that gonna happen? Please answer me that. How are you gonna ensure the safety of that every horse is okay with a biker coming up from behind them or in front of them? How are you gonna ensure the safety of snowmobiles and cross country skiers or snowmobiles and snowshoers? How is the maintenance gonna be handled? Invasive species from uh, horse waste and finances of maintaining the trail. Have the towns and communities along the trail been asked their opinion? And do they hold any weight? What about the adjacent landowners? Have they been approached about these proposed changes and their um, voices heard? Recreation opportunities need to be diverse in communities and, and counties. Diversity is what keeps people coming. It keeps economic into our communities and our county. Eliminating these couple user groups that if horses and snowmobiles were to be put onto the trail, the other users would no longer be on that trail. You would be eliminating those user groups. So how will the county make up for that lost revenue and lack of diversity in our communities? I believe the Stour is a great trail and needs to remain the same as people powered year round um, and it's a great opportunity and it's a great relationship that the county already has, county staff and the Friends of the Stour already have. Why would we want to jeopardize that? Keep the Stour as it is year round, people powered. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colleen O'Brien from Amory. I wanted to make a statement about what the Stour Seven Lakes State Trail means to me. I walk the trail almost every day of the year. I'm not an occasional user. I walk in the summer, spring, fall, and even on the coldest winter days. Especially during this time in, in history of global pandemic and widespread civil unrest, the trail has been a calm spot, safe and accessible to everybody. There is a beauty to be noticed in every season on the trail without danger of unexpected motor traffic. With 360 miles of groomed snowmobile trails in Polk County, I don't feel it is selfish to designate just 14 miles for a safe place for all to enjoy. If the Stour Trail were open to snowmobiles, the walkers, skiers, snowshoers, and children pulled in sleds would certainly not feel safe to use it in the winter. And winter is our longest season. I know the trail would no longer feel safe or accessible to me. I'm a teacher and I know the importance of sharing resources. But there are times when sharing resources has to be done in a way that is separate in order to preserve the benefits for all. Just as I don't drive my car on the sidewalk, I wouldn't expect others to drive motorized vehicles on a trail which is set aside for pedestrians. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, my name is Michelle Nelson. I'm from Balsam Lake, Wisconsin. 
I am representing Northwestern Wisconsin Equestrian Friends Network. We have 430 members and we are in favor of horses on the trails. Um, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. My name is Terry LaCour from Boston Lake, Wisconsin. I'm here in regards to the trails and I feel that the horses should be able to ride on them as anybody else does. We pay taxes. We should be able to use them also. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Wickholt. I'm from Clayton, Wisconsin. I'm a regular user of the Stour Trail. I enjoy biking and in the wintertime skiing and, uh, and snowshoeing. I feel that horses would probably be a distraction. I'm not sure how that's going to work with walkers, bikers, dog walkers, everybody else who's on the trail. Um, and snowmobiles definitely would not work on the trail. Unfortunately, this year at the Candlelight Ski, they had it all groomed for classic skiing and um, some snow, it, the trail was kind of like, wasn't there, it was kind of trashed and everybody, I said, that's odd. This has always been really well groomed and everything and they said, well today, I can't remember the number, but somebody saw like seven tr snowmobiles go down the trail and it was really hard to ski. Um, people don't understand it, that snowmobile. Was it was really hard to ski on the trail um, with the snowmobiles um, taking out the track. As I get older, I have been using the trail more and more for skiing because I'm a little bit more scared of going down hills. I know they say there's other ski trails in the county, which I also use, but they also, um, I, I like the idea of having a place to ski and to snowshoe. Um, in the winter, so I really, and I would not do that if there was snowmobiles come up on me. I wouldn't feel safe. And I think we need to keep this trail for biking, snow, snow, uh, snow skiing, um, snowshoeing, and walking, and bird watching, and everything else we like to do on the trail. Thank you very much. It's cute. <laughs> Sandy Wood. From Amory. I'm in favor of putting horses on the trail. Um, huge impact it could have. Horse, horse riders like to watch birds and stuff too. Um, you don't always have to be walking on foot to watch the birds. I think it would be an awesome idea to have the horses out there and just, just the socialization with your friends and stuff riding up and down that trail. Um, and then we could share it with other people as well. Not a problem there. Are, are you done? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Paulette Adair. I'm Craig Adair. We are longtime residents of Luck and owners of Luck Saddlery and Outfitters. We are here representing our 430 member group, the Northwest Wisconsin Equestrian Friends, and thousands of great horse people who have patronized our business for over 36 years. We are asking, please open the Stower Trail for equestrian use. Trail sharing is not a new concept. Equestrians have been a safe and successful partner of mixed use trails for many years. A few examples of converted rail bed trails, all open for horseback riding and snowmobiling, obtained from the Trail Link website are as follows. The Gateway State Trail near Stillwater, Minnesota with 18 miles, 10 of which provide a parallel treadway for horses. The Des Plaines River Trail in Northern Illinois offers over 56 miles of trails. The, the Skatacha Trail near Fairbolt, Minnesota is a 41 mile long trail and there's many more. So why does horseback riding on multi-use trails in Northern Wisconsin need to be so difficult and controversial? Because few people have misguided perceptions of trail safety and feasibility. I think it's possibly they want to keep the trails limited to their own interests. The fact is, the opportunity for trail access for horses in our county is far less than other groups. A Wisconsin SCORP regional profile reports interest in horse-related activities has increased 199.3%. Efforts to accommodate this dramatic increase have fallen far short. 
Our entire great Northwest region is significantly lacking in recreational opportunities for horses, satisfying only a 4.1% of the demand. The score is the lowest of any district in our state. It was previously stated tourism dollars from equestrians was less than snowmobiling, as it had to do with hotel stays and restaurants. Actually, we spend a hefty amount throughout the year in maintenance and recreation on our horses, feed, health care, riding equipment, vehicles, as well as travel expenses and meals for ourselves, and there's more. Most of us own a good amount of land, so property taxes add that onto the list. A recent article in the Polk County Ledger describes heavy losses in the Wisconsin tourism industry. Last weekend, we went riding at Governor Knowles. The parking was nearly full with several trailers from Minnesota. Adding equestrian access to trails will benefit our state, county, and local businesses. We have already enlisted a number of volunteers ready to help with trail maintenance. Our mem one member is a certified trail master. With additional user groups come state funding and grants available through the Wisconsin Horse Council. What is lacking is an opportunity to enjoy this public trail and prove we are good trail partners and stewards. We look forward to the opportunity to enjoy the safety of this trail, nature and serenity of a quiet ride. We are a wonderful group that offers important contribution to local, state and national economy. Please welcome and encourage these good people as residents as well as tourists. Our county can't afford to exclude this very desirable group. Thank you for your time and consideration. Hi, I'm Valencia Andrade. I'm from Balsam Lake, Wisconsin, and I'm here in support of allowing horses and ATVs on the Stour Trails. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Bradley. I'm from Milltown, and I am for the ATVs and horses to get allowed to go on the trails. I don't want Stour Trails. Okay, I'm done. Hello, I'm Dion Moss, and I'm from Milltown, Wisconsin, and I am for ATVs and horses going on the Stower Trails. Hi, I'm Julia Oline, and I'm from Milltown. I am supporting the horses and ATVs on the Stower Lake Trails. Thank you. Uh, Dylan Pepper of Centuria, Wisconsin. I'm all for the ATVs and horses on the Stower Trail. Hello, my name is Lee Ann Overman. I live in Amory, Wisconsin, and I am here to speak in support of keeping the Stour Trail people-powered and silent. I use the trail for walking, um, skiing, snowshoeing, kick sledding, bird watching, geocaching, nature watching. Um, it's close to my home. It's the tree canopy is beautiful. The wildflowers have been beautiful. The birds have been amazing this spring. Um, and I just hate to lose the beauty and peacefulness of the trail. Um, I think there's two age groups that will really feel the significance of having the trail motorized, um, children and the elderly. Um, the trail is such a great place for children. It's safe, it's um, accessible, it's easy for young parents to get there. The library has been doing amazing things with story time on the trail. And the elderly, the parking is easy, it's um, easy for them in relation to their homes. Uh, they don't have, to, it's not expensive. Um, the trail for cross country skiing is nice and flat if you're like me. You can go to the state parks to ski, but I can't do the hills. So um, it's so nice to be able to just go and ski in the beautiful quietness of winter. And so I would like to see it kept that way. Thank you. My name is Wanda Rimstead. I would like to thank all of you who are listening and will be making informed and thoughtful decisions in regards to the future of the Stour Seven Lake State Trail. I've lived in Polk County, the Amory area, for 33 years. My husband Marty and I have worked, played, volunteered, and raised our children here. And we are both in support of keeping the Stour Trail non-motorized. 
I understand the love of both motorized and non-motorized activities. Our family loves the outdoors and what it offers. Fresh air, wildlife, nature, serenity, time to think and sort out life, time to visit and time to have fun. Until 2017, my family owned ATV, ATVs and snowmobiles. There are enough trails for the snowmobilers as my husband and children and I used the trails for over 20 years. We also owned and still have bicycles, snowshoes, and walking shoes. My husband was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative brain disease six years ago, which forced us to sell our machines and our home in the country. We now live a half a mile from the Stour Trail, and I use it four to six times a week, all year long. Except for winter months, Marty uses the trail in his wheelchair. My husband is grateful that I'm still able to get exercise and companionship on the trail. And because of this, he gets a better me. There are three reasons why we feel like we need, we feel um, we need to leave the trail as it is. First of all, it is a safe place for people-powered activities. Second, it's affordable and available for people and their pets of all ages, all stages, all year long. Number three, there are numerous health benefits from using non-motorized trails. A price cannot be put on one's health, physical or emotional. Since the second week of March, we have not been able to have any respite care for my husband, so it's just me. The Stour Trail is my respite. There have been a lot of numbers quoting the economic advantages of snowmobiling in our county. Here are some numbers. These are my fitness minutes on the trail. In 2019, I snowshoed 23 hours, walked 41 hours, biked 35 hours, 99 hours total in 2019 on the Stour Trail. So far this year, I snowshoed 26 hours, walked 24 hours, and biked 14 hours in just a little over five months. I'm weird that way, but I always keep track of my fitness. Although this is my personal story, because of the amount of time I spend on it, and because I live close to the Stour Trail, I see how very busy it is, and especially now the past months during the pandemic, when all the benefits of a non-motorized trail are so crucial to the mental and physical well-being of all. My husband has not been able to drive a vehicle for six years. He can barely walk, but he never ever complains. I think we all need to be grateful for the trails that we have that allow people to do what they enjoy and are able to do safely. It's a gem of a trail and our county is so very blessed to have it. Hi, my name is Kevin McNutt, uh, 2083 100th Avenue Dresser, so I'm the Osceola Township. Wanted to express my um, comments in regards to supporting multi-use on the Stour Trail uh, for a couple of reasons, not only uh, personal and family use uh, that we enjoy, um, but also as the president of the Snowmobile Club in Osceola. So we have a strong membership of all the uh, members and families that uh, partake in the activities and uh, are very active in the club. So we've had many um, uh, club members participate in some of these reviews over time and shown the support and I think um, definitely shown that we're more than willing to uh, work collectively with the other user groups and being able to uh, share the Stour Trail um, to maximize the benefits not only on the personal and recreation side of things but also uh, for some of the local business economic benefit um, to bring not only more um, visitors to the community but also uh, getting our own residents out and enjoying uh, some of the public lands and uh, being able to support the business in those regards. And in addition, uh, as I've stated before, as a Flaris employee, um, our job depends on it. Um, with the recreation side of things, there's uh, upwards of 400 employees uh, that work in Osceola, many of which live in the community, obviously, and uh, those like myself that uh, work over in our Wyoming facility but choose to live in the Osceola area, that uh, there are many, many advocates uh, for the recreation sports uh, that go along with some of the multi-use activities, um, snowmobiling, et cetera. So with that, I uh, wanted to thank everybody for uh, being involved with the trail committees and the public plan and make sure that we can uh, move this forward in a positive manner so that everybody can enjoy it. So thank you. Hi, I'm Betsy Parrish. And I'm Sina Tagabi. And um, we reside in St. Paul, but I've been coming to Polk County, to Amory, my entire life, and my grandfather and father before that, since the 30s. And we've had this cabin, I've been coming to this cabin for the last 40 years, but uh, uh, we, my f wife's family have been here since the 1930s, uh, enjoying the, uh, our cabin at near Lake Wapagasset. 
So we came here to speak about um, what we really cherish about the trail is being immersed in nature all year long and it was just really more apparent to us than ever through the COVID-19 and having this opportunity to have something that's public um, where we see every kind of wildlife and the changing of the seasons and um, yeah, yeah, it's just and, and, and yeah. also safe because the, most of the roads near our, our, our house or our cabin are private and as a result if you want to bike or if you want to take a walk we have to deal with uh, fast moving cars and so on so this way we uh, put mm -hmm. our bicycles or we drive to uh, Idoranda or to uh, Van der Roos and we uh, take the road mm -hmm. and, and especially this year it's been uh, the closest way we can get to nature mm -hmm. in, in this part of in this part of the country yeah. and we've enjoyed it uh, immensely and in winter we uh, since we took up uh, cross-country skiing. Mm -hmm. We have been mm -hmm. uh, enjoying this thing and appreciate very much the, mm -hmm. the way the county the grooms the, uh, the yeah. port. And so yeah. uh, we find, while we understand that uh, um, many here would like to enjoy some of their motorized vehicles, mm -hmm. um, we see that in winter uh, there are a number of other uh, uh, trails that are available, like the Gandhi Dancer, which is motorized uh, for winter. And we find mm -hmm. that this particular trail here really makes this place very special and a lot of our friends who come and visit us and are looking for a place to reside are very fascinated by mm -hmm. the ability to use this trail and, mm -hmm. and, and have mm -hmm. it so close to them. So. Yeah, yeah. so along with all the other things about Polk County and Amory, I mean one of the reasons we, we winterized is that we want to live here. We come here about half the time now. Yeah. We'll be retiring here and we really you know, cherish this, yeah, this and area. And every weekend that we come here, we spend at least maybe four or five hours on this trail, yeah, we walk, doing on the average of four to five miles every yeah. every day. Yeah, we walk, yeah. we walk it from, we walked from Duranda all the way to way uh, past, I mean, almost to Nyes once. So, yeah. yeah, so we were seeing, you know, woodpeckers and turtles and we saw swans and, and I really worry about how motorized vehicles could affect that wildlife as well. It's just teeming with wildlife. Um, that we really, you know, just really appreciate. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank and you I for hope the opportunity. Everything works out. Yeah. And we appreciate the maintenance of this trail. Trail. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Shanice Kay from Osceola. According to the Polk County website, there are 400 plus miles of snowmobile trails, but only 25 miles of cross-country ski trails. 6.25 percent of what is currently available to snowmobiles. By this description, the county recognizes that permitting skiers on a trail and designating it a cross-country ski trail are different. With snowmobiles on the Stower, the cross-country ski miles become nine, or 2.25% of what is available to snowmobiles. I spoke with four DNR trail managers today who each stated unequivocally that snowmobile use and cross-country ski and other non-motorized winter sport use are incompatible, and that without question, snowmobile use will displace the skiers snowshoers, winter hikers, and fat tire bikers. It's a matter of trail safety and trail condition compatibility. The parks that have horse trails don't recommend horses and hikers and bikers share trail space either. Again, safety and trail conditions are incompatible. While they may permit walkers to share sport space with horses, it is not recommended, and they simply don't allow horses and bikes in the same space. Again, these same DNR trail managers agree that horse use displaces bike use on a trail. I have the privilege of living at the western terminus of the Stour Trail, so daily I get to see the diversity of trail users year-round. All ages, families with children pulled in bike trailers and on bikes with training wheels, dog walkers, families with children in strollers, toddlers exploring the, exploring the trail, and wheelchair users. Winter brings cross-country skiers and fat tire bikers. They come to the Stour because of its quiet beauty and the abundance of wildlife. It is intergenerational and accommodates users of all skill levels. And they come because it is safe. That changes with the addition of motorized sports or horses on the trail. I challenge you to close your eyes and really picture yourself, your family, your grandchildren, side by side on a 10 foot wide trail with horses or snowmobiles, one a huge live unpredictable animal and the other a huge piece of machinery with an unpredictable person at the controls. I am not anti-snowmobile or horse. They deserve a place as well. But every mile of every trail does not need to be designated for use by everybody. There is room for everyone. For example, the Cattail Trail, which is already available to those groups, 
and the other 382 miles of snowmobile trail in Polk County. Please leave the 14 miles of the Stellar Seven Lake State Trail for those who want access to a safe and quiet place to experience nature. Thank you. Hi, I'm here tonight in support of the Stour Lake Trail to allow horses on there. Um, I believe it was very therapeutic for anybody involved, the handicapped, disabled, mentally challenged. I believe everybody can ride on that trail safely and be respectful to all people. And let's see. The lake has, the Sour Lakes Trail has very beautiful lakes that I would like to be able to take my horses on and enjoy the wonderful nature around that area. I live in Frederick, Wisconsin, but I board my horses here in Balsam Lake, so it would be a great place for me to travel to and enjoy some time with my friends. Can you just state your name and what town you live? My name is Jen Simon and I live in Frederick, Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> All right, technical difficulties are over. Here we go. Uh, so we had the, uh, so yes, we'll, we'll move to B because we got all this. And this was, this is going to get to, uh, I think our consideration was moving it to the July board meeting is when it's uh, scheduled. Yeah. Correct. Okay. So by with this information and all the written information uh, comments, uh, that will be on our next meeting, I think, to consider that is what we'd have to do. That gives us two weeks to go through it all. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I, my consideration would be that I have all of this packet and I haven't had time to look at it. So I'd like to move it to the for two weeks. I know we want to move the process along, but there's plenty of time to get it to the July board. But I sh should look at this packet. Yes, that each of us received. So with that in thought, we, we could still we could still either move it on or wait till the next meeting. Brad, go ahead. Just a just a timing question. Um, if we wait until the next meeting, do we still make the July county board meeting when tool and design is scheduled to be here? I mean, that, just from a just from a timing standpoint. Uh, Chairman Olson, that's a great question. Um, the master plan, which we provided you hard copies with um, today, um, still needs some work. Um, it pretty much ended at the um, the work on the master plan because of COVID and and other factors. Um, at your February twelfth meeting, there's a recommendation. It is on, I believe, C one in your packet or the master plan rather that you made the recommendation to recommend SA3, which is that snowmobile alternatives, as well as uh, EA2, which is the equestrian alternative. And so that's where your work ended. Um, so there still needs to be a formal recommendation of those allowed uses. Um, you have received more public input. Uh, we did do the online survey, which was in your packet as well. If you need more time to consider the recommendations, um, we can certainly move that forward. However, you know, we've been very robust in being transparent and having public comment. So to answer your question, there's still work to be done on finalizing the master plan. Um, I, would, I would recommend another public hearing. So that would need to be posted as well. If you do postpone your recommendation to the next meeting, we'll probably need to reschedule um, tool design to come in August. So you're looking at an August county board 
discussion and uh, recommendation. Go ahead, Brad. So just a clarification. I mean, you said another public hearing? Um, because of our ex past experiences with the first round of um, master planning for this project, um, we've been trying to be very comprehensive in terms of collecting public input. Um, our staff, because we have collected a lot of input, would probably avoid that, one would recommend not to do that, but it might be a good practice to do that for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Go ahead. So how would it possibly get to the July board meeting no matter what? We could do, a, after your recommendation, we could publish the notice shortly after this meeting. Isn't that what this <clears throat> public hearing was for that we just listened to? I, I mean, I guess, I, I'm sorry, I'm lost in the process of we're having a public hearing. We're going to move it along, let's say, or whatever, um, this week or next week, and then turn around and have another public hearing before it gets to the county board. I mean, um, this process has been this process has been going on for three years plus. I didn't hear anything different today than I've heard for the last three years, um, and I'm just wondering, I guess, why it is we need two public hearings on the same issue within a realistically a three or four week time span. I was under the impression that from here it would go to the county board to go to the DNR. So um, I don't I don't think there's a need for another public hearing. That's my thinking too. I think we're, that's we're going to hear the same thing again. So that we should just make a decision uh, of the two things, like you said, where we left it after reading all this other stuff. And at the next meeting, we should make that decision after reading all our comments and then either move it on or, or see what we have to change, if that makes sense, because that would still make, I don't know if it'll make the July, but we could make it at least the August one. I think that there's probably a couple ways that we could do this. Um, I think that would be fine. Another public hearing would certainly satisfy the DNR. Uh, they wouldn't come down on us for having, you know, too much public input. But is it needed? I don't really know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, following along, I don't understand, Bob, why after all the work that's been done, if we study this, Make a decision. I think it's the twenty seventh. I I don't know what the next. The, I thought of twenty fourth. That tool design couldn't get this done for the July meeting. Um, certainly not. I uh, we can work with them to ensure that it does get done in a timely manner. Um, they're aware of where we're at in the process, so we can encourage them to meet that deadline. Okay, so we would. Uh, so on, on that part of it, then we're going to do. So our next meeting, we'll consider moving to the July board. Is what you're saying? Okay, Brad. Yeah, no, I just want to agree with Doug um, that I think we know where we're at, and I mean, I don't know. Maybe we can. Maybe we can't. Do we? What did you say they were, Bob? I think I got them right. SA3 and EA2 were the two choices we had discussed three or four months ago. But um, could we today tell them that, I don't know, we're leaning that way so that, or, you know, I mean, I guess they know we were leaning that way, what, three months ago or whatever it was, so that they could 
kind of work that way. But I, I think, I think too, I don't see any reason why if we make the decision on the 24th, it couldn't get to the, it'd still have almost four weeks to get to the July County Board meeting. Um, you know, three weeks for them to work on it, at least for sure. And I don't think there's going to be major changes throughout the, you know, every, it isn't like there's going to be major changes on every page throughout the, the plan. Okay. Anyone else? What do they think? So that'll be on our next agenda then, after we read all these. Uh, and we'll still plan to have it on the July board meeting. All right. Any other questions then on the trail? If not, okay, we'll, we'll jump to 10. It's still at a good time. C. We have eight eight C, Mr. Chair. Eight eight C. Where are we looking? How many different ones do we have? Welcome to your world. All right. You don't have a C either, do you? C, I'm not the only one. Let's do C, that consideration for a permit. Mr. Chairman, I'm I'm lost. I don't, what's what C are we talking about? Eight. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the same thing. I was. You didn't have it either. C. Eight C. I didn't. That's why. For a permit. Yeah, well, I was just saying, I was wondering why Todd was sitting here when I didn't see him on the agenda, but I was sure that he was. Oh, that was on my agenda at home. Okay. All right. Somebody passed out one that didn't have it. Okay, we all got a C now. You got well, a C? I didn't. I have still it. don't. I still don't have a C, but I don't know. Maybe I never got that good a grade in school. So. Well, C consideration of a, an event Maybe a B. application for the Polk County Snowmobile Council on top of the ATV ride on the Dandy, August twenty second. Is what we're considering. Uh, does that go through? That goes through parks, does it not? The application, Ben. And then Todd. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. The application will go to the DNR, and then the DNR um, trail liaison or trail manager for this region will either approve or deny the application, and then they will send it to us. And say, you know, if you're okay with this, here's here's our signature on this application, and then we rubber stamp it. Okay. Basically. Yeah, you're up. Okay, so basically, um, the environmental committee, as the last three years, um, gives us gives the go ahead to our group to go ahead with this then I fill out the permit, which needs to be done 90 days before the event, which is August 22nd. So doing the same route, we're going to go from uh, Lewis to Centuria and back. Um, if the committee approves it, they ask for a certified copy of the minutes when I send the application in, and then they give me the parameters of what we can do, what we can't do, times, et cetera, and then it comes back to the Parks Department, and hopefully away we go. All right, and that includes the insurance and all the other things, doesn't it, as usual? They all, come, they all come through. Of what the DNR asked for. All right. Basically, what, what this committee is saying is, yes, you're okay with us doing the, uh, the ride on the Gandhi on the 22nd of August. Okay, do we know if there's any other events? This one usually, man, we don't know that there's any other that we know of. According to the website, there is nothing scheduled on the 22nd of. Okay. Right now, there are no other conflicting events All at right. the 22nd. All right. 
Anybody else have a question? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to approve or disapprove. Not move. No, I was going to entertain the motion to approve. Okay, to, to approve? approve? To approve the ride. Okay. On the 22nd. I'll second it. Second by Brad. Any other questions of this? It's We've done it three years now, I think. Four. All right. All those in favor then say aye. Opposed? All right. Yeah. Nine is done. There's no extra D, is there? Okay. Okay, Jason's up there. Okay, so I don't know how much time you want to spend on this, but as staff, uh, we've kind of tossed around the proposed conditions that you guys looked at at, at your last meeting. I can point out a couple of changes. Um, Eric from Land and Water uh, suggested just to be more clear in that, that we add the text meets the 590 nutrient management practice standard um, so that we have it very clear what kind of standard those uh, plans are going to be evaluated against. And then uh, going down a little bit more, um, oh, up here a little bit, um, as far as the spills and that, who's being notified, uh, Tanya and that had suggested adding Polk County Public Health Department in on that line. So at, at the last meeting, you guys had talked about adding in the town. Um, so that was done as well. And you can see that in I, or L there, sorry, and that we added town chair. So basically on the copy that I provided you guys, um, everything in red was the changes that you guys suggested last time, except for the two I just pointed out. Um, then as far as staff, we've, hey, yep, go ahead, Supervisor Olson. Well, it, it isn't a big deal. Now it disappeared, was it, was it Jay there? I believe it was. Um, I missed the letter. And it isn't changing anything. I'm just wondering if, if we should place the DNR first, you know, instead of the town chairman and just kind of in order of, you know, the state, the county, the town. It isn't changing anything. It's just moving. It's just moving, I'll say, the state to the top, then the county, then the town. You know, and if the health department is above the town or whatever, I think my, um, my only reasoning for kind of putting them in that order was to try to to, to take and try to notify the local people first. You know, and that that could respond quickest. You know, and that to any spills. Yeah, and, that, I, and then kind of. I'm not opposed to it. Like I say, it isn't so, like it's a change anywhere along yeah. the way. It's just it's not really in order in that. But I can definitely move it around if you want. So, yeah, it's. Hopefully that would all be done within that 24 hours of the spill. So it's pretty much everybody's at the same time. So, yep. Um, then uh, as staff, we've received some comments about a performance bond um, and that, and Malia and then our corp council uh, did review that. And we found out that it is unlawful and that to require a performance bond or a surety bond on an operation and that underneath egg. Um, so that's not an option for the county. Um, and, and some of the other comments that we received in that were um, about having additional testing and other information in that. So if an applicant comes in and applies for a conditional use permit uh, and that before you guys, and let's say that you, um, have some issues with the groundwater you think, or you have probable cause that you think that there's high groundwater in that area and that you guys could require the applicant to do a groundwater sample and then that would be at the cost of the applicant. And I just want to take and show you some text um, and that when we're looking at the conditional use, we should be looking at conditions 1 through 12 here and that when you guys are assigning conditions on any conditional use, these are the things in that that these conditions are supposed to prevent or are supposed to protect. So it'd be the maintenance of safe and healthful conditions, controlling of erosion, 
uh, water pollution, uh, sanitary facilities. So our conditions in that, I would encourage the committee to keep our conditions very close to addressing those issues um, in order to keep them lawful. Uh, but if we scroll down a little bit more there, Bob, uh, a little bit more right on the page break. Um, so right here, um, and that C kind of starts to secure information upon which to base its determination. The Environmental Services Committee may require the applicant to furnish in addition to the information required for a conditional use down a little bit more. The following information at the applicant's expense. So we added in here um, and that air quality testing because Polk County Health and that it would like to have the opportunity to require a baseline air quality test so that um, if we're gonna be enforcing air quality, we kind of need to know what it is at the start of the operation um, and that before we can really enforce of what the operation's you know, affecting the air quality by. Um, kind of a catch all is number five there, other pertinent information necessary. Um, that, that's kind of leaving the door open for you guys and that to be able to require, you know, whatever kind of information you want from that applicant. Um, and that's all text that's in our existing ordinance today. So, and that the only thing that changed is what's in red there at the applicant's expense. So, just to clarify that, I believe that's always been meant to be at the applicant's expense, but it's just for clarification. So that's very clear. Um, I also, Passed out another document, uh, Supervisor and Chairman Nelson uh, was in yesterday. Um, he didn't know if he would be able to be here today um, because of the weather and his other obligations. Um, but he received this packet. I just wrote on there and that from Supervisor Nelson. Uh, he was supplied this from the Town of Eureka board. And the Town of Eureka, from what I understand right now, has uh, ordinance to address large-scale livestock facilities. And now they're starting to go through um, the CAFO uh, permitting process so that there would be like a CAFO permit required through the town. And I believe that the purpose of this uh, packet is just to provide you guys with some ideas on other possible conditions that could be done because uh, this is basically a pretty robust conditional use process um, and very similar in that to what uh, Bayfield County and Ashland County kind of have in their ordinance and that for a conditional use process. So um, beyond that, I can't speak any more on what he wanted, but that was the main concept that he had behind that packet. And with that, I'll open it up. I think that addressed the last, the, the two main questions that you guys had at, the, at your last meeting. So, okay, uh, go back to the first page. You missed one must on, on B. Farm entrance shall be 100 feet. Oh, okay. You only missed one. Yep, on B. Okay. Now, the next question is uh, in public comment, they asked for. Uh, a, uh, a fee of ten thousand dollars. Can you explain why we can't do that either? The, the application um, fee. Yeah. So typically, your applications are supposed to um, cover the cost of actually holding that. Um, if you guys wanted to have a special annual permit, um, and that for these, that would be something that would be done because right now, and that we would be getting nutrient management plans. There's there's going to be some fee or some time of staff. Um, and that to review these documents, even on an annual basis, um, you guys could separate it out and create a separate uh, fee for a CAFO, you know, swine CAFO conditional use permit, because this is going to be a little bit more in depth than what a normal one is. Um, but it's still supposed to be justifiable for the amount of staff time that's going to be spent. Okay, so some of that, if they have more, doesn't the uh, land and water have a fee schedule for that for reviews? An hourly rate? I think we just approved that. Yes, they, they have an hourly rate and that, but this would be done in the zoning office. Oh, in so, the zoning office. Yeah. So we should maybe maybe look at a fee schedule for something in, in there yep. if, if something like this comes up. It could definitely okay. be more than the 750 that we currently get for any other public hearing, you know, and that, but it's still got to be 
tied to the amount reviewed. of time that we're using. You know? So we should, so we should maybe look into our fee schedule again to have something for that, just to be safe. Yep, that'd be fine. And then another question was the on-zone towns; they will not be covered by this. Is they that will not. Yep. So right now, in that the shoreland area is in the unzone. Uh, sorry, the unzoned and town zone towns. And that the CAFOs, uh, swine CAFOs will be prohibited in those areas, even in those unzoned and town zone towns. Um, and that, but this ordinance here, no matter what you guys do, is not going to affect the areas outside the shoreland areas within those towns. If they're unzoned. Okay. If they're unzoned or town zoned even. Or town so, zoned. Yep. Like so. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, bonding we can't do. That was a question. The fees. Yeah. Uh, we got some of the soil, water, air stuff. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Doug, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a, a few questions. Uh, it, it's not having to do with this con consideration of what we have done. It's that I want to make sure on the next agenda that we have time to study what Chairman Nelson put, gave to us and discuss it again because we also have had health and human services come with questions that they'd like answered and that they should have time to come again to discuss the health issue side. This is a three division thing. It's land and water, zoning, and health. And they seem to have some concerns that we haven't addressed and I think they should bring them to us and we can discuss them. Okay, but now but today- also we, we need to discuss the, in the last, in the minutes in the last meeting, it said that the town officials asked to have input into this issue. And that's right in the minutes. So Chairman Nelson is bringing us a new list to look at. So we should show the town the respect to study what they sent to us. Did the town send us responses? That's right, that's right there. He just talked about um, Eureka. So, Chris, and that if you want to speak to it, I basically provided him a copy of what you provided me yesterday. Um, told him that it's basically the conditional use uh, permit procedure that Eureka is looking at adopting, and that to kind of work with their ordinance on my or large scale livestock facilities, um, and that it was just basically a, a good list of possible new conditions and that of a robust CAFO procedure. So that's kind of what I what I told him so far, and I'll let you explain it more in depth. And, and I guess, you know, I'm, I'm here too, uh, and this is chair, I'll, I'll leave you guys let decide whether you want me to sit on this committee or not, but our executive team has asked all of us to kind of fill Jim's spot. So okay. I'm prepared to sit in Jim's spot here today and be on this committee if you, and I, but I'll leave it up to the chair's discretion. Um, but what we've done is, uh, you know, a few of us on the executive team is filling Jim's spot. So don't have to, I can just talk like this or I can actually take Jim's spot and be here to finish out and do any voting that needs to be done in Jim's behalf. Uh, I don't know, we're down to the very end. Yet. I don't know if we're gonna vote on it or not yet. Uh, well, Chair, I, 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 why, don't I, why don't I just take Jim's spot and then I would be feel more comfortable to talk all right so okay. i don't know legal because i've already talked bring... i've already talked to malia about this and i maybe and corporation council should, should fill us in. in so we know so because the rules of order allow for the county board chair to sit as um an additional member i think it would be perfectly appropriate to have supervisor nelson uh, until he proposes someone to replace jim on a long-term basis, and then the full county board approves that. Okay. And that's our rules of order, how we keep it moving. All right. Okay. So, so then at this point, then I guess I would just fill you in. Uh, the township of Eureka has um, contacted me multiple times had a meeting with them a month ago, had another meeting with the town official this Saturday for a couple hours. They gave me this uh, handout 
Um, I talked to uh, one of their town um, elected officials again this morning, told him what I was doing, that I was forwarding this on to your committee here, that um, they, uh, this was just uh, going to be, I believe, on their agenda tomorrow night for the first time to review it. They felt like it was another month before they would actually work through it. He said, it's going to take us a couple months at least to get through this. Their, their thought was not that we hold up the process for them. They felt like after um, public comments, they would send someone to public comment or to county board to make any thing. So they haven't even done this yet. This was just the draft that they have on their agenda tomorrow. So it was more of a guideline. It wasn't specifically to say, hey, this is what the township wants us to do. So I just want to clear the air on that. Okay, so this is, is their draft. So they haven't went through to find out what's legal, not legal yet or anything. Not at all. Okay, that helps. Yeah. Okay. But then with Doug, your concern is, that's just a draft also, go ahead. I didn't know where we're at. I, I hadn't finished. I, Chris filled in for me. Yep. Go ahead. Um, as far as the performance bond goes, I saw your email, Malia, and it said under citing you couldn't do it. And I lost the, the second half where it talked about conditional use permit. But you can come back with an answer next in two weeks if you'd like to put that together. I just think we need it explained to us why you're saying we can't have it. Sure. So if you look at Wisconsin Administrative Code under Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection 51.30 sub 4B, that's where it says a performance bond is expressly prohibited for any siting. And the way that ties into a conditional use is because when you look at 93.90 sub 3 sub AE, which is the statute specifically. Um, discussing siting of CAFOs, it talks within that about one of the ways to get to a siting situation is to use a conditional use in a zoning ordinance rather than a siting ordinance itself. So the uh, prohibition under the administrative code would apply both to siting and to conditional use. Any local regulation attempting to regulate a CAFO could not include the requirement of a performance bond. And just to add, Maria, and that is that the chapter 93 is one of the statutory authorizations named in our comprehensive ordinance and that for our agricultural uses. So now that's kind of how it's linked to our ordinance too. So. That help you that extra? I guess I, I mean, I can't, I can't disagree with that. I just wanted the explanation yeah. of why it was being said. Sure. I have one more comment. Yep. Yep. I'm going to approach the board chair to write a resolution to include an ordinance similar or in line with the other three that I've heard of from up north, the other northern counties and Eureka. And I'll be working with him to create that. Just letting you know the heads up on it. Hmm. Okay. So, we got their draft, we have our conditions, we can still set a public hearing, I think, yet. Uh, we, we would want to get the final text so that we, we can take and publish, text. yeah, and that the purpose of the public hearing is to be able to provide the public the and that what the text is so that then they can provide comment on it. Yeah. Right. Um, and then Supervisor Rowdy, Rowdy, you should have a copy of a draft ordinance that we kind of threw together from Bayfield County. And then I changed out Bayfield going throughout the whole document and just put Polk County. Uh, but otherwise it's basically word for word what they have up there. I think I handed that out uh, late last fall and that so, yep. Um, and that the, the reason why it wasn't really spent a lot of time on that at that time was Administrator Osborne um, had talked to his counterpart up in Burnett County at that time. 
And at that time, they thought that that ordinance was unlawful. So that's why there was some direction to kind of steer you guys away from going that type of an ordinance in the past. So I respond. I'll just respond that I understand what you say. I've heard that before, yeah. but I want to look into writing an ordinance. And if we have to retain outside counsel to, to help, we'll write that in the resolution. Yeah, no, I just wanted to let you know that we do kind of have an example. And if you don't have it, I can provide you with that. That's already been done. So anyway, if you want to look at it. So again. All right. It's it. It's I got the pile here, too. It's probably ready. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm doing this proper, Mr. Chair. So you just. Holler at me if I'm doing it wrong. I guess I would I would like to make a motion that we just take this the conditional use permit. Uh, what A through A through Q or whatever they are the last yeah A through Q and approve that as the final draft, and at the same time move that draft to a public hearing date of whatever the staff sets for it. Um, and and move it as we see it today um, to a public hearing on whatever date staff okay. says they can do so it. So to take this one right now that we're looking at to move forward. Yep. Yeah. yeah on, let's say on two because that's where some changes you know are in the red. Yep. So all of all of two A through Q. Um, just call that the final draft. As as printed, and then um, move that to a <clears throat> to a public hearing as the you know as the proposed conditional use yeah. permit. Supervisor Olson, and that can I just clarify in that? Do you want this back page in that where it says owner's expense and that or the applicant's expense? Sorry, I included a bunch of. Uh, text that's already in the ordinance just to provide context you know with kind of some background on what you guys should be oh, so is in the in, on. you're asking the entire document the entire here, document Jason. dated 610 yeah and i realize that there's a lot of text in there like i said that that's not new or not proposed but in case we got going down the, the trail of assigning a bunch of new conditions i just wanted you guys to be able to look at that criteria one through twelve and that's so that you could kind of assign criteria based on that yeah so, i would yeah i'll just okay. say that i'll just say the whole document as, as it is dated 610 yep. Yep. Okay. I, because we have to get there we have to get to a public hearing before we can change whatever it is that we have in the draft anyway and that public hearing could be set up for your first meeting in july so yep oh, yeah okay yeah, well, i mean the, yeah. there, there again whenever yeah, i'll yeah. i'll leave that up to staff as to okay. to when that happens but that's anyway that's my motion Okay, motion by Brad then to move this document out. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, Chris. All right. Any other? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in my discussion, I just would like to go back to what Supervisor Nelson has brought forward in the Eureka, and we haven't even looked at it, and now we're voting to accept our conditional use, I think it's premature. I, I don't understand where we're going. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Grab um, your microphone, please. Yeah, so like the guys from town of Eureka told me, um, and that's the chair and uh, um, another uh, elected official, I had two different people talk to me about this, that they would, uh, they're gonna take a couple months on there still. And uh, they don't even know what it's going to be yet. So, the, right, it was just for information for you guys to have. They would be more than willing. They haven't looked at it yet either. So their point was, is I invited them to come to the public hearing. And when we have one and come directly to talk to this committee or the county board, then to go through these channels where they're just dropping off documents. So. 
You know, I think that's the right process. I totally support Supervisor Olson to move this thing forward so we can get public comment and get this ball rolling and get the public to start weighing in and getting these townships to come and say what they would like. So um, I, I don't think they were asking us to hold up the show because they're still working on stuff. I, I, I sense that they're going to be working on it for a long time. So, so the other way, too, to look at it, they might be taking some of ours to put in theirs. I think so. They might I, be looking at ours. I think so. Which way we went. Yeah. And, and to look into ours. That, so I encourage them to come to this committee and come to the public hearing and come to the county board and whatever the process is uh, down the road. And, and I've encouraged them to come as officials from the town and come right to this committee and, and talk to them directly. Once they got, because again, the discussion we had was that this, this, no one's going to get this document right day one. And the idea was, is what we, I think everyone would like is that this document would be reviewed and not just put on a shelf. And as these townships work through their issues, that they would have the ability to come back to this committee in the county and we would be able to say, yes, now we have some better direction. Let's go into our conditional use process and let's add this. Next year or a couple of years from now, maybe there'd be an opportunity to actually draft an ordinance like Supervisor Rowdy wants when we really can get one that can hold the standard to meet legal issues that we hear about. So to me, I don't look at this as um, this is a done deal, that, that our county would be open to just like we do with the Shoreline Ordinance. We have new information come in in a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, that we would have the ability to bring in, because every township's gonna have a little different ideas. And over the time, we at least have something in place that we can build on. So that's why I support moving it forward. Okay, so that's, basically that's the draft because it'll be after Correct. the public hearing gets changed anyway. Correct. Can, so it can be Correct. added on. To Correct. Brett. Yeah, and even at this point, if we throw our next meeting out and say it kind of doesn't count on the CAFO issue, issue there will still be two environmental meeting services in July, one before the county board member or before the county board meets in August. And if it got to that point in August of being on the county board, there'd be should still be four distinct opportunities to discuss any additions, subtractions changes whatever it might be so i think there's there's still more than ample opportunity to change it and if if we don't get started down the road we're never going to get well we're never going to get started if we don't start yeah and and so that's where if if we get it out there we have at the first meeting in july or whatever it was you said jason that's when we can start to get feedback to work on just what's here Sounds good. Uh, sounds that, good, but okay. But that's going to keep us on our timeline for our, the resolution for the moratorium. Also, we got to kind of keep, stay with that. Correct. We would be within that time, and that. Okay. And if I may add, just on Supervisor Nelson's and Supervisor Olson's comments, and that's just a public hearing. Um, if you guys like text and that, that's a lot better out of this ordinance. So that that way, we, we would just hand it out to you. You're able to make those changes. If you made substantial changes, like you all of a sudden wanted to include all livestock or something like that, that would take a new public hearing that'd have to be re-noticed and that. But you guys are able to have two public hearings and you might have information that might come out of the first public hearing that you would like to include and that and by moving it forward and that it'll give you that opportunity for two public hearings if you want. Okay. All right. So the motion on the floor then is everybody's ready? Is to uh Move this document that we received today uh, to set a public hearing. Everybody knows what that is, so yes, vote is for that. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. One opposed. So this document will move forward so that we will get quite a bit more information. And so the committee knows uh, we will be publishing this uh, summary of changes on the county website 
and then we'll actually publish a hard copy of the ordinance so that you can see it in the context and then that so that everybody in the public can see what it is. So uh, we haven't been taking and updating all of these changes out there because we didn't want, you know, 100 drafts floating around um, and that, but that will be done and that is part of this public notice just so you guys know okay. where to find it. So now we're going to set the a public hearing date. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, Brad. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, are you just going to kind of let us know when it is? I mean, I don't know that we need to. Do we need to know it today? Well, I mean, can we let staff work it out, it out and say here's when it's going yeah, to be? Yeah, the first meeting in July, or the second Wednesday of July. Yeah. Are you guys willing to do this during your normal meeting? I guess that'd be the first question. Um, and that, and if so, and that we could definitely have all the public notice done by July 8th. So. Yeah, we, yeah. Okay. I would think so. Okay. Well, that's I mean, what we'll we plan get, for. It's going to be long. We'll get our other stuff first. Put it maybe towards the end or whatever. Uh, like at 10 o'clock, you think, to yeah, start? Yeah, well, a little later so that we can do our other regular business 11 and then have that no it could be long i'm thinking 10, 10 yeah, hours think, we can I get think, through most of our stuff I, okay I, I think 10 and then there again we would want to, i mean just like all of our other public hearings we would want to post the three minute time frame yep okay um okay. that's all i need thank you okay thank you jason annual reports we got one from West Central. Uh, are we getting any others? Yes. Okay. I hope this the next meeting and we to the to do that. Okay. That answers that. So assume the twenty fourth. Our budget calendar bits that stays. Yeah, again, um, so according to our budget month. calendar, we'll be looking at those preliminary budgets at the July meetings as well. So, okay, uh, just that's just a simply an update. Okay, would, would that be the first July meeting or the second July meeting? Okay, okay. Well, I was going to say, otherwise, it would have to be at the very top of the list for the first July meeting, you know, to get done between 9 and 10, so to speak. Right. Yeah. 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 As long as we have a note of that, so that if we have anything short and sweet, we get it done before a public hearing. So, upcoming meetings. Chairman O'Connell? Go ahead. Okay. It looks like um, as product of this meeting, We'll have um, for the 24th, we'll have again 8B on the agenda, which is um, the recommendations to the county board for the Stower master plan. Mm -hmm. So you do have some time there to review what you've learned today. Um, we can also bring forward um, both health and human services and any additional municipal or town input regarding the uh, uh, the conditional use conditions if you'd like um, I can certainly bring put that on the agenda as a discussion item we can update you on the July 8th public hearing for the conditional use permit for CAFOs um, and then like I mentioned um, the annual report should be complete by then um, division wide Let's put uh, for that KFOS. So if we have to do it, then uh, 
a review fee from zoning? Did Go to that. Yeah, we'll okay. look at the fee schedule and um, bring some information forward in regards to applications yeah, for, from for, that for that conditional part. use from a, a large scale livestock facility. Sure. Oh, and the one other thing that uh, we'll bring to the meeting would be an update of our tour, excuse me, trail advisory group. Um, tomorrow, um, we'll be attending the general government committee meeting. Um, we have a, a resolution to bring forward to them. So I would anticipate at our meeting on the 24th, we'll also bring that same resolution or have a discussion about. Um, the outcomes from tomorrow's general government committee meeting. Okay. So the update. Uh, yes. Do you know if we have anything else besides budget stuff coming up? Questions? The only other thing, I think this group, uh, do you approve the Board of Adjustment uh, nominations? We usually vent them and then send them to you. Okay, we uh, we've we've already approved, or actually, at, at this upcoming board meeting, we'll be approving at the alternate. Um, what's his name? Johnson, Brian, Brian Johnson. Okay. And uh, then we have one coming up in July. Tim Lau, uh, his term is up in July. So, so we advertise every time for someone. Yeah, we've got the one for Tim advertised right now. So you see, if there was more than one, we usually they'd give us a little something. We read it. Right. So and if then, I get if I get nominations, I'll bring that here. And then, sure. Then the executive committee has a in the, in the rules of order. Now we'll also make recommendations if they have any. Okay. Yeah, that's how we we've been doing it at the last few okay. years. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he was the only one? Sure. Okay. Anything else? Of today, uh, tax deed, some of that stuff that won't come up until later. Forestry, we should be good. Do we have any in zoning? Any public hearings coming up at the end? Okay. No. Sure. Let's try for that. I mean, we don't have That's, a lot. We don't have a lot. Let's anything. put that on there. So that might help too. Okay. Then we don't know what will come up. All right. Good job, Chris. Yeah, number 12D. D, I make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Brown. I got to give the old Jim Agile a lot. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Yeah. I'm proud to do it for Jim today. Every, every, every meeting. I've been here for four and a half years or whatever, and I don't think he's ever missed the I said, I mean, if he was, if he was here, it was him. Okay. <laughs> nice to know. Hopefully I'm only here for one more minute.